the objective of today's session is to really try and demystify uh, the changes coming into force on the 1st of October. Um, I am just going to start sharing my screen, so bear with me at one moment whilst I do so. So as Fran was explaining, this is really the essential guide to compliance and the amendment known as Natasha's Law um, has been brought out thanks to the lobbying group led by the parents of um, Natasha Ednam Laparouse, the teenager who sadly died after suffering an allergic reaction um, to an undeclared ingredient in a pre-packaged meal. Um, the government confirmed um, that stronger laws would need to be implemented to protect those with food allergies and give them greater confidence in the food that they buy um, in the future. So with less than four months to go, what does this actually mean to food service operators? So from October 2021, all foods produced and packaged for sale at the same premises must be labelled with a full list of ingredients. These changes are being introduced in England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland to ensure a consistent UK-wide approach at the same time. So let's actually look at what foods are classified as pre-packaged food for direct sale, or you may hear it more commonly referred to as PPDS foods. So pre-packed foods for direct sale, foods being packed on the same premises from which they are being sold. So that could be a packaged sandwich, or a salad that has been made by staff earlier in the day and placed on the shelf for purchase. So just to clarify, the food is packed before it is ordered or selected and includes food that customers select themselves, including pre-wrapped items kept behind the counter. So just to clarify, that's food which is packaged at the same place it is offered to, to consumers and it is in the packaging before it is ordered or selected. Um, and that includes um, foods kept behind the counter and it also includes foods that can be sold and offered at mobile or temporary outlets as well. So we understand that there is going to be an impact on food businesses, especially um, with the deadline now fast approaching in October. Under the new rules, food businesses must clearly display two essential pieces of information on all PPDS food. So that two pieces of essential information is the name of the food, and it must also include a full ingredients list with allergenic ingredients emphasized. The emphasis can be done by either the allergens being shown in bold, italics, or in a different color. And there are 14 allergens that must be declared by law. If you're not sure of them, there are going to be resources shared with you after our pre-recorded panellist discussion, um, which will provide you with a full resource centre available so that you can check the allergens and also find out a lot of other um, advice, support and guidance to help support you through these changes. So we understand that there is an impact on food businesses, but how will this impact on you all? What are you actually responsible for from the 1st of October? So the main area that you need to start looking at is around providing accurate food labeling information across all sites that you operate food service. So anything that you offer must be updated as new products are listed, as recipes change, or when products are substituted by a supplier. That means that you must have really strong communication channels with all of your food and beverage suppliers. So that's maintaining strong communication with those suppliers 
and those suppliers have a legal obligation to provide the exact ingredient composition of any foods bought from them. And alongside that, you need to start considering the allergen awareness training with all of your staff that work in food service areas. So you must ensure that proper allergen management systems are in place and that staff have up-to-date allergen awareness training, but also understand the importance of Natasha's law. And this session is going to explore that in more detail. So shortly we'll go over to a panellist discussion with my um, colleagues Karen and Steve so that you can start to understand how supplier and food service operator have worked together to tick all of these boxes so that accurate information, supplier communication and allergen awareness training can be put in place in readiness for the change taking um, place on the 1st of October. Ideally, by now, you will have already have started preparing for the change as there is just over three months to go until the 1st of October comes around. The timeline that you're seeing on screen at the moment is going to be shared with you as a resource after this session. But let's just look at it really quickly now whilst it's on screen. So ideally by now, you will have already undertaken a software and a hardware audit within your business. So you should have been looking at whether you have printers available so that labels can be printed out. And also, do you have automated solutions in place in terms of software to help you manage all of the data that you will need to have accessible to you to produce labels to ensure that you are conforming with the information um, amendment? Automated solutions will reduce risks associated with allergen management. Now that we're in June, it's really time to start focusing on staff education and training. So any staff who are involved in food ordering, uh, so that means ordering the food from suppliers so that you can then go on and surface it with, um, serve it within your business, and or involved in the preparation and selling of that food need to be trained on allergens. We're going to hear from Steve at Yorkshire Wildlife Park on some of the steps that he's been taking to ensure that all of the staff are trained appropriately. Once you've taken those key foundation steps of software and hardware reviews and staff education and training, July should really be the month where you have a trial run. So your staff should be trained, your supplier information should be uploaded and accessible for your food preparation areas, and recipes and labels should be created in your chosen software. So July is that month to actually trial it and make sure that everything is working as expected. And if it's not, you're aware of it so that you can make tweaks to those operational processes to ensure that you can still be ready in time for October and that you're not opening up your business to risk. So August is exactly the month then to be reviewing and refi refining everything that you've been doing in the preceding months. So make sure that your living process is smooth and risk-free. You still have time in August to get everything in place, taking forward the lessons that you will have learned in the weeks leading up to it. And in September, if you've taken the steps to review your supply chain, your stock, your software and your staff, it means that your business will be ready for the 1st of October because the 1st of October is just where it starts. It doesn't mean just getting you there and having you ready. It's actually ensuring that you are ready for the 1st of October onwards. So it's really important that you start thinking now about what preparation you need to undertake to have you ready in time, where you have any of the gaps in the process and what you need to do to um, get you ready. And as I say, joining this session today is a great first step for that. And then the resources that we'll be sharing with you a little later on will help support you from this point to ensure that you can be ready. 
So as I've been saying, we know that for many, the changes being introduced can seem daunting and perhaps a little bit complicated as well. So that's why we've put together this real world case study being talked through on this session with people who have been facing into these challenges already to really showcase that you can be ready still for the implementation of Natasha's law. I was delighted to catch up with Karen Butler from Brakes and Steve Batty at Yorkshire Wildlife Park last week to really break down those challenges being faced into across the sector and explore how a great relationship with your supplier, planning staff training and raising general awareness across your business means that you can be ready for the 1st of October. So Fran, I'm going to hand back to you and we can start playing the pre-recorded session. Thank you very much. Okay, what a great video to start this particular session. And Steve, as we've just been seeing from that video, you are in charge of the operations for all the different food and beverage hubs across the park. What challenges have you recognised and realised that you have to face into with the introduction of Natasha's Law coming in October this year? Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for that introduction, Claire. Uh, much appreciated. I think um, the, the, I think the first thing to recognise is that this law is actually a good thing, and I think most people sometimes or industries think that when government introduce law, it's sort of not helpful. Well, I think this is really really helpful for the customer, and also for people that are you know working in the hospitality industry. So you know I think that's the first thing to say. But the main challenge for us really is that we have a wide variety of food and drink on offer on the park. Uh, so that's the first challenge. The second one really is about the people. And for us, and like many other, many other industries, is that we've had the challenge of COVID for the past 15, 16 months. But also now that we're opening up is that we have a challenge now where we're recruiting, as we do every year, seasonal staff. And what, what the challenge I've got this year is that we have to recruit those seasonal staff that are sometimes leaving school and going to university or college. And in between those six weeks of going off to college or uni is that they want to earn some money. And, and obviously for us is that they're only with us for six weeks. So we have to get across this law very, very quickly at the start. So, you know, that's the main challenge for us. Uh, the other thing to think about as well is, is ignorance, I think, is that I don't think many people realise that this law has been introduced on October the 1st. It's certainly not in the news. So that's one of the first things to sort of try and get over is that people may think it's not going to happen to them. And I think like a lot of things, they think, well, it'll happen to someone else, etc. cetera. Um, you, know, and, you know, fortunately or unfortunately for us, I think when it happened to Natasha, uh, I think it was back in 2016, is that uh, I think probably most companies and industry that was in the hospitality business is that, you know, unfortunately for pret a it was them. But I think most of us thought at least it wasn't us or I'm glad it wasn't us. And I think that's the first thing to get rid of is that it could be any one of us in this in this room today that it will happen to. And that's really been my big thought over the past three or four months is how do we get across this new law to our seasonal staff and to our existing staff? So, you know, those are the challenges. One of the other challenges that we've got is customer demand. 
is that they are wanting far more information than they did, let's say, 24 months ago. You know, in terms of not just about um, Natasha's law, but just in general, allergens in general that they want. You know, there's there's more people getting allergies now. So, you know, we have to be ahead of the game, really. So, you know, there are the main challenges that we've got here, Claire, at the park. Mm, thanks, Steve. And, and you're right that the, the sad reality is that food allergies can be fatal. And it's just too risky now, I think, um, where um, a business causes a situation where someone can ultimately consume the ingredient that they're allergic to. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's why all the ingredients um, must be listed. And as you say, that's really the purpose for Natasha's Law, to make sure that your guests know exactly what is in the food that they're eating, including those 14 EU allergens um, and any other foods that they may be able to eat. And I think that's a big trend that we're seeing regardless of Natasha's Law. Um, and ultimately, it's what Natasha's Law is going to start underpinning. So, so thanks for that insight, Steve. And um, Karen, hearing um, what Steve has just said, um, and with you being the, the key contact as the main supplier of food products to the park, alongside a large portfolio of River Breaks customers that you look after on a day-to-day -day basis, how has the conversation changed in, in recent months because of Natasha's law? Hi, okay, Claire. Thanks, Steve. Um, it's... It's been really varied, I'll be honest. Um, I think the main concentration for, for customers has been coming out of lockdown, reopening their businesses, getting restocked. Um, and the concentration has been around that. So I think it's been very, very varied. There's been some customers that seem to have some knowledge and there's been others that, that don't. Um, so we've been speaking to customers since early this year um, just to let them know that the laws are changing to be aware of what's coming. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say Claire, very, very varied. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think businesses are just starting to realise that suddenly it is June and um, October suddenly doesn't seem that far away. So I can imagine, Karen, that that conversation is going to continue quite intensively um, over the next few months and, and beyond. So that's really interesting. And Karen, just sticking with you on a moment then, thinking about what you've just said, Obviously, we know that Yorkshire Wildlife Park is, is one of your key customers within the Brakes portfolio. How are you helping them specifically to implement those processes? And with that, what guidance have you been able to offer Steve and the team across the park? So um, on an ongoing basis, um, we provide all of the allergen data for everything that um, Steve and the team buy from us. Um, I think where that's changed is is to really look at the, um, the detail on the products that they buy from us the most. Um, we've been able to break down um, sub products for them uh, based on their top 100 products, what those allergens are on the sub products so that Steve and the team can see if we are out of stock on um, the top products, exactly what they can order in its place and, and be reassured with the allergens that go alongside that and just provide them with as much information as we can Fantastic. And Steve, thinking about what you explained earlier about all the challenges that, that you're facing into, not least reopening the park off the, the back of a pandemic that's affected everyone in, in some shape or form. Why were those decisions, so working with Karen and those decisions, why were those so important to make? Well, that, yeah, thanks for that. It's a good question, Claire. And, you know, one of the things I did, you know, when we were closed was um, with Natasha's law looming in October is, you know, was it a, was it the right time to review supplies? You know, I review supplies on an ongoing basis really, but we only have contracts with, with a, a few of them, one of them being breaks. We've always used breaks since two, you know, since 2009 when the park opened, you know, but I've used breaks for, you know, 20, 30 odd years in my career over in catering. So, you know, one, I know what, what breaks are about. I know their strengths and I know their weaknesses, you know, and equally breaks and Karen know Yorkshire Wildlife Park strengths and weaknesses. So that was really important in terms of, you know, in terms of risk, which is really what Natasha's Law is about, is was it the right time to perhaps move supplies or, 
or bring in another supplier to take some of the Brakes products away? The answer was no, because this year isn't the right time to do that. With Natasha's law coming into, into effect in October, uh, going with a supplier that you're comfortable with and that you know was really, really important for us because, you know, as an example, we have an ABL, which is an authorised buying list with Brakes, where, you know, none of my kitchen managers or dry stores manager can buy products that is not or signed off by myself on the authorised buying list. So again, that reduces the risk of perhaps new products coming into the system that perhaps we wouldn't necessarily know about. You know, and if I'm really honest with you, we've had that in the past, you know, not from breaks, but we have had substitutions where my stores managers accepted it because, you know, we want to carry on trading with the, with the product and um, the ingredients have changed. And, you know, now more than ever, that's so vital that we know if there's a substitution that the ingredients are listed for us and breaks do that for us. Mm, yeah, that's a really interesting consideration, actually, that maybe some people and businesses haven't thought about until now is, is actually managing the real world scenario of what you order versus what gets delivered and, yeah. and the knock on impact that that can make, especially from October. And I'm going to ask you both a little bit later for any piece of advice um, that, you, that you would consider giving food service operators. And that may be one of those areas is really looking at your products and, and auto subs as well so Steve just continuing with you again for a moment um I would imagine that there's had to be some investment in support and training in terms of um what you need to do to train up and support the staff across the park so bear in mind the support that you've been getting from Karen and Brakes what approach are you now taking regarding the training of staff in preparation for Natasha's Law so, so in terms of obviously um, investment in, into the people, obviously it's been, and I suppose like every other company in the in the UK or the world, is that since COVID started, since the pandemic started, we you know we've all been closed at various times of the year. Um, you know, for us, uh, we've been closed five months of the twelve. You know, we've had the animals though to keep feeding. So we haven't closed and everything's been furloughed. We've closed, furloughed people, and then, but we've carried on having to feed the animals. We've also had the challenge of we've opened new restaurants and a new entrance. So that, again, has been quite a challenge. Uh, but one of the things that we are doing and we are committed to is investment in the induction at the start of when new people come on board. And one of the things that we're doing at departmental level is that we're putting aside 30 minutes where we're doing a 30 minute slot of, of videos and information about Natasha's law and actually to make to ensure that all the new starters and all existing staff are fully aware of how serious that this could be and that Natasha's law is coming in on the 1st of October and we really, really must ensure that we're well aware of of, of that law and that we're we're trying to educate all the new starters and all the existing people about it because I think a lot of people will not be aware of it even when it's in effect you know mm -hmm. so what we're doing is we're doing a 30 minute video really and perhaps from myself some words at the induction point to talk about in you know what to do in the event of someone asking about ingredients mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we're doing again to reduce the risk is that we're looking at what we make on site and what we could potentially buy in that's pre-packaged with the ingredients list already on there. And thinking about your staff there, Steve, a couple of interesting points um, I picked up on. So you're obviously working on the induction and, and just making people aware that Natasha's law is there, which, which is fantastic. But are you taking steps to empower your staff to ensure that even if they get asked on the spot at that moment in that pressurised environment, what do they do if they're not sure of the answer? So in terms of that, if they get asked a question, you know, what will, what will be there as well will be, um, you know, whatever the menu is in that, in that uh, unit, because we have a variety of, you know, we have a 
fully serviced restaurant down to a trailer serving coffee. So, you know, there's a huge uh, spectrum of ingredients that we've got on the park. But one of the things we're doing is, um, you know, working with um, yourself, Karen, Brakes is virtual chef where um, all the supervisors will have access to virtual chef, which we're using to look at all the allergens and all the ingredients that may cause harm to someone. And so they have remote access to that. But equally, what we've also said is that if they do not know the answer, to please refer it upwards. Yeah, to everyone, you know, at the end, it may be myself that's here that needs to find out that answer. But what we mustn't do is guess. So we're trying to give them the empowerment and the information so that they can answer the question quickly and efficiently. But equally, we're saying, don't worry if you don't know the answer. Please refer upwards and tell the customer that as well. Yeah, and it sounds so simple, doesn't it? But actually ensuring that all the staff that work at the park are comfortable in being able to say, I don't know the answer, I need to go and check with someone is critical, isn't it? In ensuring yes. um, that any risk risk is mitigated, yeah. And I guess as well, thinking about, you, you mentioned a moment ago that you know, you've know you got everything from a, a huge new restaurant that seats up to 400 people at any one time, yeah down to um, a hut on the park that's serving beverages and some yeah. snacks. It's yeah. aligning, I guess, the right staff to the, to the right job. So you wouldn't necessarily put a new member of staff working alone in, in the hut. Would that be yeah. correct? Yeah, redu reducing the risk all the time in terms of, you know, the new starter perhaps that's, that's got no experience, but has got a great personality, you know, they wouldn't be the right fit for a sole worker or a lone worker. So we would put those with other staff members with more experience and a supervisor. And we'd probably move the more experienced staff into those units that are working as a, as a lone worker. So again, yeah. you're just reducing the risk all the time. And again, you can always review this. So once it's, you know, like anything, once it's come into effect and it's been in maybe a year or two, then people start to get to sort of do things naturally anyway. A bit like wearing a mask now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, we've all got used to that, haven't we? Definitely. Yeah. So I'm going to stick again with you for a moment, Steve, because you've alluded there to, to some of the um, uh, processes and safeguarding um, that you're putting in place um, across the park. And to me, um, it sounds, Natasha's law and the introduction of it, sounds a little bit daunting and perhaps a little bit complicated as well. So thinking about what you've done so far and what you're going to be doing in, in the months to come, what advice would you offer as a food service operator <clears throat> working in a large scale leisure and hospitality business? What would you perhaps offer to any of the, the people listening in to this webinar today? I suppose there's there's two or three bits of advice is is the first one is it's it's your people that will obviously make this easier or harder for you. So therefore, do a risk assessment on, you know, where the if for instance, where the most ingredients or menu items are. And at the start, try and put your strongest team members with the most experience there to, again, reduce the risk all the time. Keep it simple, because actually I know it's a law, but actually if you break it down, what you need to do is tell people what allergens are in that product that may cause harm. And I think if that's keep that at the forefront and keep it really simple in terms of the start. But and 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 I suppose for me the last bit is if you're the you know you're the leader of that team is you will set that standard. So if you're taking it really, really seriously, I think I mentioned right at the start about ignorance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think maybe we all were at the start, you know, before Natasha, unfortunately, died from it, perhaps we were all a little bit complacent on allergens, you know, but things have been brought in. So, you know, take it really seriously and then your team will take it seriously because you will set the tone for it. 
Yeah, good advice. And Karen, I'm going to ask the same question to you, really, but from the Brights perspective, is there any advice or guidance that you could add into that to support people listening in today? Okay, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say definitely um, that the system um, Nutritics offers um, can really support customers. It just really gives the, the tools that they need to be able to answer the questions that they have. And certainly speak to your suppliers. We're, we're here to support and to help um, and to always still read, though, your labels. Um, because, you know, with everything that's out there with Nutritics, with the information that we can give, um, ultimately the responsibility is still with yourselves um, just to make sure that you know that the labels are, are read as well um, outside of that um, and and I think you know if, if you've got that it just gives you the confidence that you're doing the right thing yeah yeah I think that's really important is is having that confidence and that's one of the reasons why Nutritics and Breaks have partnered together to deliver Virtual Chef Online and really what that is is that one-stop shop for food service operators enabling them to build recipes using a live product data feed um, and then that empowers menu management alongside the unique Breaks Development Chef service um, that is on offer. And it gives customers as well the access to a customised label maker solution. And really what that helps to do is ensure compliance with food law whilst making it really simple. So taking out the complication um, that a lot of food service operators are, are starting to experience at the moment. So thinking about Virtual Chef Online and Steve, Yorkshire Wildlife Park has been one of the early adopters of the system solution. How is that starting to help you across the park at the moment? Well, I think in terms of um... You know, I mentioned people before being probably the, <coughs> excuse me, the weak link. Technology, if embraced right, is really, really good and effective and saves time. So, you know, in for us, Virtual Chef has been really helpful because obviously it highlights the allergens that are in a recipe. Um, you know, and what we're trying to do here is to try and make things on park and, and where we can, we make, in make recipes and ingredients and and items and dishes on park with our chefs to try and develop those. And when we put the recipe in, what Virtual Chef does is highlights those allergens that are in that product rather than relying on a person to tell you what that's, what's in there. So, you know, in terms of that, it's, it's been really helpful and it's saved a lot of time. Yeah, and I guess it's really helping to back up those processes that we touched on a bit earlier with substitute of products, etc. So it's helping to put in automated processes around yeah. no last minute changes to ingredients, um, no substitutions of a dressing or a sauce without checking and ensuring that the correct label goes on the correct yeah. product as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And Karen, sticking with Virtual Chef Online, how is that aiding any of the conversations that you're now having with other customers as they start to plan for Natasha's Law? I think it's, it's really helping, Claire. I think, um, and certainly been able to use the experiences that Steve and the team have, have had with virtual um, chefs so far. Um, it, it's really selling the benefits of, of what can be, what can be done um, and, and really taking the emphasis away from what customers would have to find out themselves and being able to get that from a system, I think is, mm. is great. Um, so yeah, that's really helped me with, with conversations. I always think it's, it's very useful to have some tangible evidence from a, a working customer, which we, we have with Steve and the team. So yeah, it certainly helped. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Well, Steve, Karen, thank you so much for all of those insights. Um, certainly for me, listening to you both, I think the common theme throughout the session is the recognition that the implementation of Natasha's Law is just around the corner um, and that failing to comply with that legislation could lead to, lead to fines or worse, but that actually there's a, there's a moral 
arguments around ensuring the safety of customers when when they're on site at your your food service business and that's certainly for me listening to you Steve is something that you and the team at Yorkshire Wildlife Park have actually recognized some time ago and um, so hearing what the measures you're taking alongside the support of Karen and all of the team at Breaks have been able to find. It's been really enlightening. There's obviously a lot of support and guidance there in terms of purchasing behaviour and how to make sure that that is streamlined um, to help safeguard you and mitigate against any risk into the future, but also being able to offer um, an industry-leading software solution via Virtual Chef Online does show that there are solutions out there that are effective, but also um, um, affordable as well, which is great to hear. So we're now going to come back live to you all so that we can start to answer some of the questions and answers um, that are being shared in the chat at the moment, and also share some of the key resources that we've got available for you as well. Hopefully everyone can see on screen um, the QR code which um, you are more than welcome to zap on screen and have those resources direct to your phone. There's also um, a URL link there as well that you can use, but, but don't fear if you're not able to download them now. This will be made available once this webinar is completed today. We'll be posting this um, video on our event YouTube channel um, and also on the um, event um, side of the breaks um, website as well, which you can access through the breaks homepage. Um, Claire, do, I just uh, wondered if you wanted to say a few words actually about um, what people can download here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, by scanning the QR code, um, you will have access to the UK Food Labelling Resource Centre. Um, which is a non-profit information group um, that aims to support the effective rollout of the new food labelling legislation. It's completely free. It is available to anyone um, based in uh, just on a website, um, but it really is packed full of, of hints and tips, plus downloadable guides, um, which will walk you through the challenges, um, help to provide solutions and definitely gives advice on what you need to be doing to prepare for the changes. Um, and it will also talk about the, the, the role of software in mitigating risks. Um, as well as giving you that implementation plan um, that I showed a little bit earlier on screen, um, but in a bit more, um, it's a bit more in depth. So it will really help to walk you through what you need to do with three, three and a half months to go, um, which will hopefully help all food service operators um, to get them up and running and conforming to new laws by the 1st of October. So I would highly recommend that that is downloaded and that that is shared across businesses as well um, so that you can avail of the free resource available yeah thanks Claire just um, a little bit of an overview then about the webinars that we've got uh, planned for the rest of the event to help you um, on obviously Natasha's law and some other great topics as well so tomorrow we've got uh, minimizing food waste at 10 o'clock so how to protect your profits and the planet a really great session um, from too good to go um, Arla Pro um, just talking around all the ways that you can um, minimise food waste within your business. So, so don't miss that one. Um, 22nd of June, we've got um, um, the CGA joining us um, to take us through latest um, consumer food trends and how the pandemic has affected those. And then please join us again on the 24th of June for the follow up to this session, which will take you through some really practical ways of preparing for Natasha's law and how breaks can can help you um, and as Claire mentioned it will give you an overview of um, Virtual Chef Online um, which is obviously break solution to help you. Then on the 1st of July we've got Perfect um, Pairings which is a food and wine pairing masterclass from Babendum. Um, on the 8th of July we've got the first of two of our social media sessions um, getting started with your first social um, strategy and how to measure success. Um, we've got Love British Food joining us on the 13th of July talking about the benefits of British food on your menu and how um, you can implement that um, some some great ideas and tips and then on the 15th of July we've got um, our last webinar social media part two where we'll take you through three 
buy free great tools that you can use um, to really take your social media to the next level within your business. So hopefully those sessions are really good ones. Um, you can join up from the event part of the Breaks website, which you can join um, and find through the um, Breaks homepage. So please do sign up, um, but also look out for the recordings of them as well, which we'll put on YouTube in our event um, playlist. Um, and also, again, in the event part of our Breaks website. So thank you ever so much. So without further ado, we'll go to the live um, Q&A. Um, so we've had um, a few questions come through already, um, guys. So the first one um, asks, does the law, does Natasha's law extend to having segregated, segregated areas in kitchens to avoid cross-contamination of allergens from different soup foodstuffs and handlers? So I don't know, um, Claire, if that's one uh, for you to answer, perhaps. Yeah, it's it, it's a really good question and I can understand um, why it's being asked. And again, it's, um, it, it's showing that there is um, some complicated areas to still address uh, with the introduction of the new laws. Um, it doesn't, um, it doesn't extend, it doesn't require you to have to have segregated areas in kitchens to avoid that cross-contamination. So to, to support with that, food businesses may um, voluntarily use labelling, um, such as producing a kitchen which uses or may contain or not suitable for. Um, and those statements are already used to communicate the risk of the unintentional presence of an allergen. So that could be milk, egg, peanuts, um, almonds in the food product. And that's typically due to the allergen entering the product accidentally or through cross-contamination. So you can use those statements in labelling already, but they should only be used after a meaningful risk assessment is being performed. And there is considered to be a significant risk to the food um, allergen or food intolerant consumer. Um, the statement shouldn't be used as a substitute for good hygiene and safety practices. So in summary to Mark's question, um, no, it doesn't mean that you have to create segregated areas, but you should be undertaking meaningful risk assessment um, and ensuring that you have the correct labeling in place to ultimately protect that consumer who's going to, who's going to take that food away. Um, I don't know if Steve has, has anything further um, to add to that from, from the food service side. I think you're right, Claire. It's just doing the risk assessment. We've we've obviously got a number of kitchens where we buy in foods pre-packaged, but we also make food on site. And all we've done is just reduce the risk and label, as you've just said, may contain, etc. The the other thing we've done, sorry, we've just opened a, a an ice cream parlor and we could have 24 different flavors of ice cream. What we've done is we've taken the three ice creams that contain nuts in and we're just not going to serve them. So we, we've, we've still got 20 flavours, uh, but we've taken the three ones that contain nuts out. So I suppose it's all about reducing the risk, isn't it? OK, um, so we've had um, a few others come through. Um, one just come through the chat, actually. Um, we understand the requirements are for pre-packaged foods, but do we expect it to extend to made to order as well? Well, again, um, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, there are no signs at the moment um, that that is going to be something um, that, that comes into play as part of um, the food legislation. Um, but that doesn't mean um, that changes aren't going to, to come into force um, into the future. All that we can comment on is, is the here and now. Um, that is with Natasha's law and that is the pre-packaged food made on site earlier that day to be taken away. Um, so that is all that the law um, extends to at the moment. So that is the same. We quite often get asked about takeaway and, and delivery um, businesses. Um, so they are not um, affected by Natasha's law because that food currently is made 
fresh to order. Um, so it isn't pre-packaged before the consumer asks for the food. So therefore a label doesn't need to be present. So Caroline at the moment, um, no, that there, there are no signs, but we know that there is lots of um, food uh, reviews being undertaken at the moment within the UK and um, the resource centre, which we've made available to you, will be consistently kept up to date so that you can keep revisiting that and find out all the guidance and advice that you need. Thanks, Claire. Um, had another one come through. If I'm giving away fruit food, so say at the end of trade and you've got leftovers that you want to give away, is that affected by Natasha's law? <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, the S in PPDS can perhaps be a little bit misleading because it stands for sale. Um, I think it's fair to say, and Karen and Steve can, can probably back me up here, that despite the legislation being just around the corner, um, there is perhaps still some grey areas um, that, that need to be clarified. Um, and certainly UK hospitality is pushing the FSA um, hard on getting clearer um, guidance on, on what Natasha's law will affect. Our advice at the moment, and certainly what Karen is, is providing to, to her customers within the Breaks portfolio, and we touched on it as well in, in, in the discussion, is, is the moral argument. So it is classed as foods that are sold. Um, however, the advice would be that if you are pre-packaging any foods, even if that is to not physically take money for, but you are allowing a consumer to take it away from your business, it should conform to Natasha's law and therefore have a label. Um, yeah. Steve, Karen, I'm not sure um, if you have anything that you add to that. No, I think totally. Sorry, Karen, you go. You um, go, Karen. Um, so, so I think um, customers that I've spoken to, I've certainly, um, I've, I wasn't sure, Claire, and obviously, um, you know, I, I have asked you um, a few questions, which you've kindly come back to me on. I think um, I, I've always said to customers, you know, best practice is to have the information there available so that if um, if customers do require um, the allergen information, you do have it on site. And that's certainly something that, that I always advise all of my customers. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, somebody's asked, um, I provide catering to schools across the UK. Does Natasha's law apply to me? Again, it's, it's really going back to address how you serve that food um, to, to the consumer. So whether that is a child in a school or a person walking into a cafe or someone visiting um, Yorkshire Wildlife Park, how are you serving that food? So it's identifying out of the food that you serve at your place of business, is it pre-packed prior to the consumer choosing it? So for schools, it's usually quite interesting. So I usually split it down into two areas. If you have a school canteen and you are serving fresh plated food on a hot counter or, or similarly you offer a salad bar and you can go in and plate that food fresh, no, it doesn't need a label. But Karen picked up on it a moment ago where you have to ensure that if anyone does ask you about allergenic properties or what ingredients are included, you have that information available. And to answer that question, it just doesn't physically need to be put on the label. But if you are a school, and it kind of goes back to the, the S in sales, if you are a school producing pat lunches that can be taken away for a day trip when they used to happen. Um, so um, you were 30 school children are going on a school trip for the day and you are preparing the pat lunches that are pre-packed um, before that school trip. They must have labels on it. The food must have labels on it. So it does have um, a knock on effect to hospitality, leisure, healthcare, and education, depending on the service um, um, that is offered. And Steve, again, you operate a lot of different food service operations across the parks. So there's probably something that you can add there as well. Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, we're just, um, you know, we have all the allergen information available, whether it's, you know, pre-packed anyway, or we make it on the premises. Mm -hmm. So again, it's all about reducing the risk, isn't it? And and I think, as I said in the in the film that we pre-recorded, that it's all about having the information to hand so people feel quite safe in terms of 
the information you're giving them and that, you know, they feel that we're well educated in this. Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, someone's asked a really interesting one, actually. Can the ingredients be listed by means of a QR code? <laughs> is that because we put a QR code up on yeah, screen? <laughs> <quite> <laughs> <a bit. laughs> um, no, um, that doesn't make you okay. compliant with Natasha's law if it's PPDS food. So um, you must have a label on the packaging. A QR code will not suffice. OK, there's, a, there's a, probably a slightly uh, tricky one here then. So somebody has asked, I think they've got a deli counter, what if you have an unpacked sandwich on sale, but then once it's sold, you package it up for the customer? Does that require a label? <laughs> um, no, because it wasn't pre-packed um, right. before the consumer selected it. So um, if it is fresh, the, the consumer has the option to ask the question. So again, it goes back to you must be able to answer the question if you're asked about allergenic properties and the yeah. ingredients. Um, because that gives the consumer the option to not choose that food or ask for something to be removed from it, for example. Um, so then if it is put in a bag later, once that consumer's had the opportunity to ask that, it doesn't need a label. It is If it's been pre-packed before the consumer can choose that, it needs a label on so the consumer can make an informed choice of what, what they're going to take away to eat. Okay. Um, we've had a question um, from a business that produces cakes that are ordered online, which I think is probably something that sprung up quite a bit actually in, in lockdown, um, that are going to be posted out. Do they have to declare the ingredients or can they just list the allergens? So that basically cakes um, and anything like that, you're absolutely right, Fran, it's become very popular. Um, yeah. lockdown afternoon yeah. teas being served etc. Um, it's, it's classified as distance selling um so that is for example distance selling is is a, an order for food that's placed over the telephone or, or internet for, for delivery at a later date or time um they already require um allergen information to be provided before the food is ordered um, and when it's delivered so it's not affected by the new regulations because again when the consumer phoned or placed the order as long as they've had the option to see the ingredient list and the allergens contained within it before they've chosen that food, it therefore doesn't need a label on it um, when it gets um, delivered. Steve, is there anything to, to add there? Because you probably get click and collect orders and things um, pre-ordered with you. Well, no, we don't We do not do click and collect orders uh, at the moment. Um, we're just in the middle of changing our uh, uh, booking system etc so all the technology is changing over the next few weeks um, mm -hmm. but yeah I just agree with you Claire in terms of the you know the clarity again of having it having the information so the customer can make that informed choice isn't it really yeah. Yeah, whether it's at a counter or online I suppose yeah completely and I think Fran we got asked just another question um, about best practice for unwrapped foods in, in display cabinets. Yeah, that's a good um, one. Yeah, and uh, you know that again is something that I see quite regularly, you know, if I go into a cafe or, or anything. Um, so just to absolutely clarify, if you are a food service operator, you need to determine pretty quickly um, what foods are classified under the PPDS rules, so the prepackage um, for direct sale. And it is only those foods um, that need to have labels produced on it. So for foods that are not packaged, so are on a display cabinet, for example, um, it goes back to what we've just been saying the last few minutes. As long as you've got a way to communicate allergens and ingredients to the consumer, it doesn't need a label on it, should then that fresh food be chosen that hasn't been packaged previously. Right. Um, we've got one about pizzas. Um, can you clarify the requirements for a pizza delivery chain? Do we have to provide allergen information at point of sale or at point of delivery? Um, and do we have to provide ingredient details at the same time? Again, it's it, so many pizza places have, have been able to start up um, in lockdown. So um, it's probably quite a popular question, actually. 
Yeah, and again, and hopefully this session is helping to demystify and, and take away some of that complication and, and confusion. Um, so pizza delivery falls under the same rules of the cake a few moments ago, the distance, the distance selling. Um, so where that order is placed over the telephone um, or, or the internet, yes, you need to have the allergen information available to give at the point of sale and um, yeah. so that the consumer can make an informed choice but then the pizza doesn't need i mean of course if you want to add it to the packaging then fantastic for more reasons but it doesn't need um, a label it doesn't fall under um, natasha's law and the changes that are coming in on the first of october okay um, and then i think this is the final question but i'll double check um which body will monitor and enforce the law <laughs> yeah um, yeah it's it's a really good question actually because it, it will be monitored and um it's really really important that businesses are, co are conforming to law so basically it will be the the ehos the environmental health officers um they will be adding this to their inspection list um and they will issue um enforcement or or charge or change orders and they will escalate as required. So if they consistently find a business um, that is not conforming to, to legislation, um, then they will take necessary action. Um, so it will be added to an EHO um, inspection list from the 1st of October. Okay, thanks. Uh, we've had a, a question come through. If the operator doesn't provide this information, um, who can we make a complaint to? Yeah, it's um, it's a difficult one. There isn't really an escalation path to make a complaint to um, if a supplier that you are using is is not conforming to their side of the deal, um, for example. Um, legally, a supplier is required. Um, we touched on it earlier in the session. They are required to provide um, the full components of, of the ingredient list. Um, if they refuse to, um, our suggestion, again, Steve and Karen will talk about this and the strength of the relationship between the park and breaks, you should consider changing the supplier. Um, you have to make sure that you are receiving this information. And Steve, Karen, I'm sure that you would probably back me up with, with, that, with that comment. Yeah, I think the other thing um, you mentioned, DHO, Claire, is that um, my, my two kitchen managers today are meeting our EHO at three o'clock today um, to discuss, obviously, our food policy uh, to, to incorporate Natasha's law, but also, I think, to gain the local advice from DHO. I suppose the other thing, if a supplier isn't uh, being supportive, is, as you said, swap suppliers, mm -hmm. but also, I suppose, you can phone the local EHO as well, because they have obviously a right to go and inspect any premise. So, you know, that that's another way of trying to do that as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I think, um, you know, for, from our side, I know, uh, and, and all suppliers should have this, you know, spec sheets available, allergen information available. Our technical team is fantastic when it comes to, you know, providing a, a complete list of, of everything that's contained within um, within a customer's buying list. So certainly, you know, I, I would have thought most suppliers should have that information and should be able to provide it. Well think that's the end of the questions everybody so huge huge thanks um to everybody who's attended we really hope you found this session useful as i say we have recorded it so do feel free to revisit it on the breaks website or our event youtube channel just want to also thank our amazing speakers today um claire from nutritics karen from breaks and steve um from yorkshire wildlife park who've been so insightful and so helpful um in sharing um their information tips ideas considerations etc so huge thanks everybody um do look out for our second session on the 24th of june and, and have a great rest of the day thanks everybody Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. bye bye bye